Hi, okay. welcome everyone. Hello. Um, as you're joining now, um, welcome to the first Gazelli Digital Private View. Um, so I'm just going to go over some little rules just so that we would all be comfortable in this digital environment and communicating. So if you could possibly remain muted for the period of the presentation, because we are going to have a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions for the time being, you can either raise your hand in the comment section on your screen, or you can write the questions in the chat. And one of my colleagues will kind of collect the questions and we will get these answered at the very end. We are currently in presence of four fantastic artists, one of them an artist duo, as is in Kosher and also Calio Pilamas and Francesco Giudice. So I'm just gonna quickly introduce the gallery and introduce them. And then we will have a look through the works that are gonna be part of our Borders exhibition. So if anybody has questions, do feel free to ask them. This is the first time we're doing this. If you experience any technical difficulties, feel free to log out and log back in again. So uh, the presentation was still gonna be running. We're still <laughs> gonna be here, uh, but if anything, Hello just log out and log back in again. Um, so basically what we're going to do today is we're going to go through the works and just to let you know for the videos that uh, and the installations that are part of our current exhibition we're only going to be showing you small clips which are previews of the whole experience. However, we will be screening these in full later on throughout the show, so do keep an eye out. I will announce more later in the presentation so you will be able to know uh, when things are happening. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. Uh, we hope you enjoy this first ever digital private view. And yeah, welcome. Um, I hope maybe everybody's here. Let me just admit a few more people. Um, as they're coming in, let me give me a second, right, right, I think we are all here now, um, so if you experience any issues with sound once again, um, just log out and log back in again. Uh, try to avoid turning on your video um, so that we could uh, kind of uh, have the uh, exhibition running smoothly. Um, so one, if you kind of run into any issues, we're kind of here to help. So do just message us on the chat um, in the Zoom application. Um, right, so I think we are ready to start now. So welcome everyone once again. Uh, we are Gazelli Art House, uh, a gallery that was founded in 2003 uh, by Milas Karva in Azerbaijan, and then we opened the space in London in 2012. And we present uh, kind of an ever-developing, very vibrant program of exhibitions uh, that uh, works with international and local artists, showing sculpture, video art, installations, uh, digital art, and also virtual reality once a year. So we kind of cover everything from between traditional mediums to kind of new media works. Um, and today, as I mentioned, we are joined by some fantastic artists who are going to be part of our group show Borders. Uh, just to give you an outline on the show, it is an exhibition that is a first for our gallery. It's the first online exhibition for us. And uh, the reason why we wanted to uh, have this exhibition now is because we thought it was a very relevant time to talk about the concept of Borders and how these affect us on a global level uh, as well as in a time of crisis. So the foundation of this exhibition was laid actually before we started the quarantine and we aim to preserve this dialogue later on. So we're actually going to have a physical exhibition of these works in our space later on in the year. So do keep an eye out. So this is kind of just to give you an idea of what is to come as well, but also to demonstrate these works as we're exploring them now. Um, and just to give you kind of a brief snippet of uh, what we're gonna be discussing today, um, a lot of the artists that we are exhibiting in this show are discussing subjects such as globalization, uh, world inequalities, and show how these are dealt with 
not either well not only with diverse mediums but also um, from diverse points of views and diverse subject matters. Um, so without further ado, uh, we are gonna start um, our private view today with uh, Anthony Aziz and Sammy Kusher, who are joining us today from New York. They have been working together for over uh, two decades now and working in such mediums as sculpture, animation, uh, new media and video installation art. So the work has been marked by a distinctive concern regarding technology and how technology impacts the human body and consciousness. Um, so their photographic practice started in the early 1995, where they were looking at these very interesting, uh, at this very interesting subject matter of how we are directly affected by how we are perceived in the digital world. Um, they are both on the faculty of Parsons School in New York and have exhibited in such venues as the Indianapolis Museum, the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, Venice Biennale, amongst many others, and their works are part of the collections such as the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Maison Européenne de Photographie, and National Gallery of Australia. So uh, we're going to start off with viewing a clip, a preview of the, their um, multimedia uh, installation, which involves video and sound. So just a reminder, this is only a preview. And then I'm going to hand over to um, Anthony and Sammy to kind of tell you more about the work. Anthony and Sammy, up to you. Should we jump in now? Yes, yeah. absolutely, please do. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for that introduction and thank you for including our work in this exhibition. Um, that looked really good, actually. So we're very pleased to see uh, how something so immersive can at least try to convey some of the impact that is meant to be felt when you're actually in the space. Um, we should maybe just provide a little context for what we just saw and also understand that it's the foundation for the work that will come right after this <clears throat> and we can talk a little bit about that later uh, what we just saw was a clip of a 12 or 13, 13 oh. minute long uh installation looped video experience that's uh that has surround sound and eight channels of video we worked with a group of performers and a choreographer to develop a performative language uh, that were, the performers were shot in a green screen studio and then placed into a variety of different landscapes that you got to see just now um, as a way to create the sense of, of a kind of infinite space where the, the land and <clears throat> the notion of place and space and home uh, becomes very abstract. So when you're standing in that space with the performers as image around you, you have this rather uncanny experience of, of merging into the space of the landscape. So hopefully that was captured in that clip. Um, yeah, well, I just wanted to add a little bit also of, of, of backstory is that the um, uh, the, these characters or these figures that are in, in wandering through this space. I mean, they are in a way uh, 
maybe refugees, maybe ghosts, maybe uh, people who have been displaced or who have been, um, uh, you know, in search of a, of a, of a place. Um, uh, and also, um, there is there are different elements that come into in, into into their emotional lives, uh, whether they can be in a state of shock or in a state in a state of suspension. Um, their movements are digitally manipulated, so they don't move very realistically. They are kind of choreographed as as um, almost like puppets that are subjected to uh, forces that are invisible to them that that force them to move in particular ways of attachment and displacement. Um, I mean, this all sounds very abstract when I'm speaking about it, but one, when one experiences the installation, which is life-size, and you are in this room with them, these emotional states become quite uh, uh, palpable and are, are very much the experience that we wanted to, to convey. It was also, I think, important to, to know that that one project was part of a larger exhibition that we were commissioned to create for the exhibition in Indianapolis in 2012, which was the result of a lot of research and work that we did within the Middle East, especially between Israel and Palestine. And my family comes from Lebanon and Sami's family is based in Israel. So we're very um, attached emotionally, you could say, to the kind of longstanding trauma of that land. So we're looking at land from these different points of view but the piece is not specifically meant to be about a particular place. It, it emerged from that conflict, but it is looking at this notion of, of land and home much more broadly. That's great. So, shall we? Back to you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, now we're going to have a look at a few of your works. So we're starting with the fantastic tapestries that you have produced. And if I'm not mistaken, am I correct to say that I think this one was one of the first ones that you've done in the series? This was the first one indeed, yeah, in 2014, yeah. Um, so the, the, the tapestries are a continuation of the, of the work in the video installation. Uh, the first tapestry, some people, uh, comes directly out of, out of the, the, uh, the installation. You could say that it's almost like a, I guess, like a frame that conflates the whole installation into one single frame, in a way. Uh, the tapestries that came afterwards were development based on the same idea, but including other references and other topics that um, uh, were more uh, uh, present at the time that we were making them, but also uh, questioning the notion of, of ideologies and power and um, our place as artists in the, in, as witnesses or as participants in this uh, world event. Uh, so uh, the tapestries were very much an attempt to engage with the notion of almost historical painting or, and, and to go back to the history of tapestry as emblems of power and, uh, and asking, you know, where where is that power today? Where the, where is power is a lot more diffuse and, and less uh, less easy to to identify. So that's something of the thinking that goes into the tapestries. But they say the process of working with performers and photographing them, uh, creating this basic basically a collage that then is rendered as a woven piece is part of the you know what what these pieces are about. But it's very interesting how uh, you kind of also draw back to this photographic practice, even in the tapestries, it's very fascinating. So we also have a fantastic series of your works called Freeze. And uh, there are these amazing inkjet silver screen prints. And these have photographic elements as well as um, I'm aware of, correct? Well, the, 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 there is always a photographic basis in, in, in the sense that we start photographing figures, models, dancers. And then they are processed into uh, different different works. Uh, if you saw these pieces in front of you, you would not recognize any real photographic element other than maybe the basic outline of of the bodies. But these are very layered uh, pieces, and they're uh, um, they're 
very handmade as opposed to a digital um, print or anything like that, even though there is an inkjet at the, at, in the base, there are several layers of silk screen and gold leaf that give them a very uh, sort of like you know, texture, textured uh, and, and atmospheric quality uh, as in, you know, in, 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 prison, in presence. They and these also come directly just to, they come directly out of some of the imagery that we started to work with in the video as well. If, if you spend time looking at the video, you'll start to see how some of the image echoes back and forth between the three different media. And this is a kind of methodology that we've started to develop with our practice where we will work with performance and video and installation, which will then be translated into other media such as tapestry and print. And also the, in, in these pieces, the, the motif of the dance is something that appears very much in the video, in some of the tapestries. Uh, and it's, um, it's part of our, of our view that these this notions of history uh, or, or, or when you view areas of conflict, uh, life kind of continues and goes on. And, and there is always, uh, along with, with, with the suffering that you can experience, there is also a kind of continuation of joy or a continuation of events of life. And we didn't want to take like a one-sided view of, of these ideas of, of uh, areas of conflict. Uh, so there is always both a kind of tragic and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and also sometimes even a comic aspect to, to what we do with that. Thank you. Um, so uh, if you don't mind now, we will continue on with our exhibition and uh, look at the pieces of um, photographer and video artist Francesco Giudici. So Francesco in, uh, um, kind of explores the ever transforming social landscape over time and in particular looks at the urban anthropological phenomenons when creating his works. and. Uh, as far as you're kind of going to see in this exhibition, uh, we have a video presentation as well as photography, but Francesco's practice kind of encapsulates research as well. So he kind of collects a lot of maps and texts uh, that act as um, kind of carriers of the stories that he looks through in his work. And uh, he is on the faculty of the Visual Arts and Curatorial Studies, as well as Photography and Visual Design um, in the Nuova, uh, Nuova Accademia di Bellarte, apologies for the pronunciation, um, as well as the uh, Scuola Holden in Turin. And Francesco has exhibited in uh, such exhibitions as Documenta, the Venice Biennale, the San Paolo Biennale, and the ISB Triennial in New York. And his works are in the collections of Cassel Durville in Turin, Tate Modern in London, and Prado in Milan. So without further ado, uh, we are going to uh, watch his uh, film called Morocco Affair. This is just a uh, part of the film. Uh, the full film will be screened uh, later in the exhibition. So we have a very exciting program upcoming, uh, but I'm gonna hand over to Francesco to tell us more about the work. Thanks, hello, good evening everyone. Thanks for joining. And yes, uh, the Morocco Fair is, is, is quite an old piece. It was, it's a video which is uh, more than 15 years old. It was shot in 2004 and actually I'm very thankful to the gallery for 
picking up this piece because it's 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 been it's been a while since it was last seen so i'm very happy i i still think it's quite contemporary and and actual so i'm very happy that it's part of this exhibition um uh the film is it's quite it's quite a strange piece for me because it's one of the few works I've done in my life which was like a something uh, happening suddenly and it was not really part of a research or an ongoing project. Uh, what happened, I might say the story because it could be interesting for someone, what happened is that in 2004 I was in, in, a, in a small city on the border in between Morocco and Algeria. It's a city, it's a town called Oujda. And I was there for another project. I was there with my old group, which was named the Multiplicity. And we were preparing an exhibition for the um, Tony Tapias Foundation in Barcelona. A totally different kind of project. But then what happened is that one day while, while we were doing the residency in this city, while we were staying there, in Madrid, uh, the, the terrorist attack at the train station of Atocha, the stations of the trains in Madrid happened. And, and, it ha and when, we, when it happened, we were in Ujda. And what happened is that uh, two of the terrorists were actually born and raised and living in Ujda, which was just a coincidence. And we were shocked by the event, shocked by, uh, by the, the, uh, knowing that, uh, having the knowledge of, that, of the fact that two of the persons involved were from the city. The city was very small. It was like a very, uh, a commu very it was a community. So everybody knew everyone. And the very strange thing that happened is that the, before this happened, uh, the relation between uh, our group and the community was, had been so nice and warm and charming and uh, as you can imagine. The day after, everything changed uh, back and forth. Uh, everybody was looking at somebody else with, with a sort of suspicious looking. We, we, don't, we don't know why, it just happened. And, um, so I started to feel very unease and I, I felt that I wanted to do something about the, the, the change of feelings that suddenly happened just because somewhere else something was happening. So what I did, I, I was just thinking of, of, of the community and then I started to realize that the most interesting thing I could do was to do an architectural project. Uh, going back and forth in between two or three cities that we were visiting, I noticed that along the coast there were a few new uh, uh, towns uh, which were like uh, realized in, in the last years, uh, certainly around 2000, 2001. And the, these houses were actually second houses, vacation houses of a very special kind of community. It's a community called the um, uh, MRE, uh, which is usually Moroccan resident à l'étranger, which means not only actually people from Maghreb, they could be from Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, who are based in Europe, who are like first or second generation migrants in Europe, in rich countries like Belgium, Denmark, Germany, Fran France, or whatever. And they usually spend their pocket money back at home. The money, the, the, the money they have spared, it could be really pocket money in, in, in Germany or Belgium, but it's, it becomes a huge amount of money in their original countries. What they do, they build houses, build houses for when they get old and they retire, vacation houses, whatever. And all the cost was a sprawl of these very small, let's call them gated communities, Alphaville, which look very gorgeous, uh, especially to the other communities who don't work and live uh, in Europe or abroad, wherever. But what I noticed visiting these places, which were mostly under construction, is that the architecture was a hybridation of two architecture languages. One was a very ancient and local kind of, of architecture. So you could recognize elements from Arab or Moresque kind of, of, of of style. On the other hand, here and there, you could recognize elements from Spanish or Belgium or Germany or North European architecture, which means elements from the architecture of the countries where these people were actually now living and, 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 uh, and spending their, their, the rest of their life, probably. 
So this mesh up, this hybridation of cultures was, from my point of view, much, much uh, forward and much more uh, open-minded than what was starting to happen since 9-11 wherever in the world. And I already had started to work on the consequences of 9-11, especially the cultural, uh, social, economical, religious consequences of 9-11. So I was very struck from this, the, the imagination of these uh, weird architectures. Most of them were bad architectures, but who cares, of course. It, it, it's the, the, the iconic imagination that they were displaying was stronger than anything. So what I did, I, by chance, I had a small handy cam, which was an infrared, a thermal Google kind of uh, camera, very cheap, very small, but that, that with this function. So for three nights, I went visiting three of these uh, communities, uh, gated communities, which were mostly uh, abandoned at the moment, either because they were under construction or because the inhabitants would be in Europe. It was March when we did the film. So I went there with, with one of my assistants and um, spending one night in three, uh, for each of these three gated communities and we were filming at night. We were hidden in the grass uh, with a handicam doing this very simple um, and formal, informal kind of videos. And I also had a, a, a long distance uh, microphone. So we also made a later in, when I was back in Milan, a mashup editing of the video and the audio too. But I, I, you, the, the video is actually 81 houses in a row, one after the other. Mostly I was trying to film them in a very frontal way. And of course, I used the thermal Google view or the infrared view because it was for me the heritage and the collective uh, heritage, uh, collective image that we have after the, the end of the first Gulf War. And I, of course, I wanted to play with this kind of a common experience we had. Um, and, and, and let's see, there is nothing very intellectual to say about the movie except that it was really uh, coming mainly from the belly rather than from, from an intellectual perspective like most of my works. It's, it's, uh, it was strange, it was very fast. I just thought and did it and edited it a few days later in Italy. And I, I hope everyone will have the chance to see the full movie. It's a very simple and boring movie. On the other hand, it can also work like an hypnosis because you keep on watching these houses and after a while, the houses get erased, and the only thing you see are uh, details, details of uh, the architecture and how they, uh, the European and North African elements uh, hybrid themselves. That's extremely fascinating. Thank you so much. And I do encourage everybody to join us when we screen the entire film. It's actually extremely intriguing and definitely worth seeing in full. And I find the sound is plays quite an interesting role in it as well, because at times it's very quiet and at other times there is these kind of um, cultural elements that seep through, which is very, very interesting. Um, so now we're gonna have a look at some of Francesco's photographic works that are gonna be part of the exhibition. Um, so we're gonna start with uh, What We Want, Mazara, and Francesco, if, would, if you could possibly tell us more about the What We Want uh, series, because it has been ongoing for quite a long while, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, this is one of my oldest projects, and it's the oldest of my ongoing um, atlases. It's a photographic and writing and performance work that I started in around mid 90s, 95 more or less. And it's an atlas of photographs and writings done around 180 cities around the world in the five continents. And actually, the, 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 the element that takes these works together is a concept which I usually tell it by watching landscape as a projection of people desires. So the capacity of communities to subvert what governments or architecture or local laws think our inhabiting should be like. Uh, the, 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 the project is very old, so it, it, it changed in time, not formally, but conceptually. In the beginning, it, it was uh, less political. It was very much about uh, human and urban communities uh, facing each other. But since 9-11, it turned into a more um, 
political kind of geopolitical kind of work. And since 2008 and the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, it turned uh, even financial and economical elements were involved in the project. So it's like a portrait of social landscapes that, that I hope to bring with me till the very end. So as long as I can, of course. Uh, this is one of the, um, quite all these pictures is, is from 2000. It's Mazara is a beautiful, small uh, fisherman village in the very, very south of Sicily. So it makes it one of the southeast points of Europe facing uh, North Africa. It's really uh, in front of a Tunisian fisherman village, which is called La Goulette. They, they, you could almost, almost, almost swim from one place to another if you're a good swimmer. Now, what happened in time that the, the, the tiny, the small uh, area of Mediterranean Sea in between Mazara and La Goulette, it's, a, it's very crowded of fish. It's a wonderful place for fishing. So illegally, the Tunisian community and the Italian, the Sicilian community, they helped each other in time to fish, actually, illegally in this very uh, rich uh, fishing area. And in time, the community uh, uh, melted. So you have a lot of Tunisian fishermen who married Sicilian girls, and there are a lot of Sicilians living in, in Tunisian. I have been in the uh, kids' school in Mazara, and, and most half of the kids are talk Arab, and, and the schools teach both Italian and Arab. It's a beautiful way, a sample of, of you know, of, of, uh, of no border kind of community. Then something happened. Um, the, the Muslim community in Sicily, they raised money to build a mosque, uh, a, a religious place for them. They had the money, they went to the municipal, municipality and the mayor of, of, of course agreed. They gave them a piece of land and the, and the legal papers to do it. They were starting to build. But then the, the, the church, the Catholic church from Palermo, uh, the major city in uh, Sicily, they came in the story and said, it, it's better if you would not do that. That would disorganize the cultural feelings of religion in Sicily. So in the end, the mosque was uh, uh, stopped, even if it's illegal, because you could do whatever you want in Italy, at least theoretically with, with, with religious places. And um, so the Muslim community started to be very angry. And what happened is that they started to, po you, you could see that small and very enraged uh, mosques start, starting to pop up everywhere. This one, for example, is a small garage, which should be rented for cars. The, the community, the Muslim community rented for, for praying. And of course, it was, a, it was a place full of anger. I was interviewing them and they were not happy at all with the situation. But the very important for me, the thing is that this picture is one year earlier than 9-11. So for me, it's, a, it's sort of changing the perspective of the beginning of the conflict, of the religious conflict that was part of the 1911 uh, phenomena. So it, actually the, the year of this picture for me is quite, quite interesting. And I don't want to add anything else. It's, it's, this is enough for, for, the, for this picture, of course. Yeah. It seems like it was quite a very kind of big transitional time that was very yeah. kind of strongly felt by the community of that region. It's extremely interesting. Um, so let's have a look at some of your other works. So I think one of the other ones that uh, you might want to talk about is uh, the Toulon Pueblo uh, picture over here. I'll be very short, yes. This is a picture I made in 2006 in, in, in Pueblo, uh, Toulon, in uh, Quintana Roo in Mexico. What happened is that the um, central government in Mexico was starting to give back the land to the natives. Uh, the, the land, of course, they are giving back is, is just a piece of shit, totally lacking any kind of value. But at least it was a sort of whatever. They were recognized as an identity. One thing, uh, um, when they started to build, uh, the, 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 the local government of the Quintana Roo was building the infrastructures, the houses, which are behind these walls, uh, the, inf the infrastructures, so water, electricity, whatever. 
the only thing which was asked to the natives community that they, they, they should have not been doing was to build walls. And the first thing they did, which I found was very interesting, they walled themselves inside. First thing, even before the infrastructures were closed, you, you can still see these, probably now they, they are not there anymore. This is an old picture. These huge black tanks for, for, for water. They, actually, it's the, the people from inside that did it, not the government. So the, the first thing they wanted to do is really uh, give up with Mexico. Of, of, of course, it's, it's, it's more a rhetorical image than anything else, but they did it. And I was very interested in this idea of, of, of it was a statement more than anything else. There are doors. I, I tried to get in and they refused me, uh, um, which I totally understand and share the, the, the idea. But one thing which is interesting, I didn't have a, a wide lens, so I couldn't, I couldn't do the picture in one time. So this is actually a diptych, it's two pictures. So I did, uh, and I don't like wide lenses anyway. So I did the picture for the left uh, corner until the center and another one on the other side. And there was this woman, this mother with the two kids, I guess it was a mother with the two kids walking along the wall. So I, I, I did the first picture, then I waited the woman and the children to, to turn the corner and keep on walking around this, uh, sort of ancient new city or whatever you want to call it. It's actually very close to the uh, ancient Tulum. So it's very, very interesting. And, and it looks all old already. And, and so I, 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 I did a double picture and it looks more like a motion picture rather than a photograph, of course. It's not very, it doesn't look very much like a Roland Barthes kind of snapshot, of course. And, and that's it. And it's, it's, it, I wouldn't say anything else about the picture. Very, very interesting. Thank you, Francesco. So uh, we have a few more images. Uh, let me know which one stands out to you and uh, you might uh, want to talk about. I, I, I would tell something, maybe yes, like maybe to the last one, the last one, the next one. The Bethlehem one. Yeah, this is a picture I did uh, 10 years ago in, um, I was having a, an exhibition in Tel Aviv and then I spent some time traveling through Israel and Palestine. I had friends on both sides, so I could, and of course, uh, I was very interested to, to, to um, have, uh, listen to opinions from inside rather than, than from home or somewhere else, like we are usually used to. Um, this, is a, this is a very difficult picture because I actually had to come back many times and I was also stopped one time and almost arrested another time from uh, Israeli police while I was doing this picture. Uh, and I was very fascinated by this place. Um, uh, it's very difficult to talk about this picture. If you can see in the middle of the picture, there are two, a woman and a man who are collecting olives in a very old and ancient way with a stick. The man is uh, let, letting the olives throw from, from the trees and the woman, probably his wife, is collecting the olives into her, uh, into her, uh, her skirt, which reminded me of my, of my grandmother in, in, in the south of Italy when I was, when I was a child. And, and on the back, there is a, t a, a very modern Israeli settlement but at the same time, it's very ancient because it look, it, it's on a hill. And the buildings are buildings inside, but they look like walls on the outside. And there's also a tower. So it reminded me of uh, middle age Italian uh, towns on the hills in Tuscany or Umbria, you know, protecting themselves from invasors, invaders or whatever. And, and and also the day I did the final I could do the picture it was a very foggy day so the, the first part uh, 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 this is done from Palestina this kind of this picture the, the, the first element is very neat clear but the back is very foggy and and uh, I don't know it it it, it looked at the same time very contemporary but very old at the same time it was like a sort of space time collapse in this picture. And uh, I didn't, I didn't, I, I traveled a lot uh, through Israel and in Palestine, but I was overwhelmed by the situation. I didn't really do many, many work there. 
And anyway, it was much more interesting to uh, understand as, as far as you can understand the, the perspectives rather than doing work. But th this is uh, something I wanted to do. And um, uh, I wouldn't spend uh, very much more words on this, on this photograph. It's uh, it, very clearly, as I told you, after 9-11, all of my photographic work in, in, in the What We Want Atlas became more and more political. And this is very clear. As most of my political works, I, I, I never try to force anybody, anybody into a perspective. I just want to bring people to my observatory, which is a, usually, a, usually a, 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 an observatory where you don't understand anything at all. I always think about photography as a place where, where good questions are built. But then I also think that photography must be completed by spectators if they have enough uh, interest in doing that. And I don't want to steal more time to Calliope, so I will say that's enough. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. I find your work is very humanist. It's, it's a lot about kind of humanity and what we experience um, uh, in different cultures and on a daily basis. I'm just going to go back and forth to show you more of the works because we uh, went through them quite quickly. Um, so just to, to show you some of the works of Francesco's that are in the exhibition. And I think uh, you have photographed around 200 uh, or 150 countries? 180 cities in, yeah, in yeah, 180 know, cities. Counties, more or less. Yeah. So it's a very uh, kind of multicultural project crossing all of the borders. Um, right, and now we will um, head into the series of the works by Calliope Lemos and Calliope Lemos is a Greek-born London-based artist who works in sculpture, painting and installation um, and we are presenting some of her works including works on paper as well as uh, kind of more sculptural wall pieces and a video work as well and over the past decade her paintings and sculptures have explored uh, the narratives of existential journeys the concept of displacement and politics of forced migration as well as uh, tackle, uh, tackled such subjects as women's rights on uh, many different levels and she has exhibited quite widely internationally and her work is in uh, such collections as the Borsan Collection in Turkey, the Onassis Cultural Foundation in the USA, and the Bilge University in Turkey. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone, and Calliope, I'm now going to hand over to you to talk about these fantastic large drawings. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation this evening. Uh, I did enjoy the previous um, uh, this, uh, talks. So let's see how I can uh, uh, entice you to my work. Uh, so uh, the way that um, my work has been arranged is um, a few drawings um, and uh, some reliefs uh, ending with a film. Um, the drawings that we are seeing in front of us <clears throat> are uh, drawings and uh, collages. Uh, what you're seeing um, uh, is Japanese um, handmade paper um, creating veils of transparency and uh, underneath there are uh, captions from newspapers. Uh, this particular image uh, says energy versus public health. This work um, was done uh, in uh, 2016 and it was exhibited in um, uh, Gazelli Art House uh, in a show called um, In Balance. Um, I was, I was uh, then discussing um, the principle of balance in, li in life and uh, what goes wrong uh, if we go beyond balance. Um, so I was very surprised to find that this um, energy versus public health, uh, of course, is an issue that we are facing right now again. Um, you know what we're what we're suffering from and uh, and experiencing right now. Uh, so. Um, Often I find that my work is prophetic. Um, uh, it is drawn from experience as well as issues that I'm facing, social issues, and, um, and uh, it develops um, almost um, instinctively. And I then uh, follow uh, what, what I have done and discover that I, ha I have uh, actually 
um, I am saying a lot more than I intended in the beginning. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, if I might um, introduce myself uh, a little bit like a painter uh, who became a sculptor about 20 years ago, and uh, uh, I was totally seduced by color. Um, and uh, I, was, um, I was painting since uh, when I started. And then eventually uh, the three dimensions uh, became much more of, a, of um, an expression for me, feeling that they are um, more um, uh, expressing the human being. The human being is a three-dimensional um, uh, thing. And so the three dimensions are much more uh, what uh, I needed to express what I needed to say. So. Um, and uh, the issues that I'm focusing on are mass migration um, and uh, also the uh, dignity of, of, uh, uh, of women and the injury of the dignity of women uh, over years. So um, if we, if we uh, proceed with the next drawing, uh, Tina, uh, again, uh, this is from uh, 2016, which is, uh, you know, quite early, and uh, you see a very natural form there. Uh, in fact, it, it's like a seed, uh, and um, in fact, it has a very threatening look to it, and the caption underneath uh, says, at every level of our society, uh, it is under threat. And again, I was very surprised to, to, to see this work right now because it does look like a very strange um, object, although it is from it comes from uh, nature. And uh, again, um, it it kind of alludes to the coronavirus and what we are facing. It's a very very uh, peculiar form. And uh, instinctively, I put underneath this caption and uh, that society is under threat. Uh, and I put this uh, this form in front of it, uh, really not not uh, knowing um, uh, with my mind what I was doing. But there there you are. Mm. <laughs> That's what I'm saying with my work. This this happens to me often. So if we could proceed to the next image, please. Uh, it's quite a quite a foreshadowing piece, I would say this one. Yeah, yeah this one. Um, it says, "Don't die like my son." Um, and uh, all of these works uh, somehow uh, are uh, <laughs> as if as if they were uh, uh, they were made today um, very strangely. And uh, again, I'm using the Japanese paper uh, to overlay um, and create uh, uh, veils of of uh, of what one can see and what one can imagine. So um, I'm, I'm again talking about uh, the pain of a mother uh, losing, uh, losing her son, uh, whether it is uh, for war or whether it is for, you know, what we're facing now, or, and, um, and uh, that's what this work is about. Uh, it, it, these works are photography and drawing, um, uh, actually uh, superimposed onto the photograph. Um, and the last one here, um, it is uh, Thousands Enter Isis. Uh, again, it is of the same year. Um, and uh, Isis, I'm thinking of it as the, uh, the goddess. Uh, and uh, this is the image of a goddess. And yet underneath Isis is a very threatening um, uh, organization uh, that, was, um, uh, that was a lot of deaths have uh, resulted uh, from its, uh, uh, you know, what, what it's been doing. Mm -hmm. So it is a contradiction. Uh, we have the, the word Isis, uh, which is an Egyptian goddess, and then we have the death uh, coming from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, that particular organization. And uh, at the same time, the next uh, four uh, works that you're going to see called Boxed Worlds, uh, uh, were created um, in the same year, and uh, I think that they refer again to what we are living now. So um, these works are a reliefs. What I have done is that I went 
to find reclaimed wood from old houses, uh, the roof of old houses. And I wanted to create these boxes um, to give the impression of something that it is very protective, um, like we all need our own home, um, uh, the shell where we hide and protect ourselves. And yet this home can become a prison. Uh, so here uh, we see the photograph of a, a, a hand, uh, almost as if you're raising a hand because you want to speak to someone, and yet there is the X and the metal pieces in front of it um, kind of erasing you and uh, shutting you out. And uh, it becomes very claustrophobic and uh, it, it gives you the feeling um, of of the shell becoming a prison uh, itself. So if we move to the next work. Um, again, this is a, a, another of the boxed worlds. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, uh, there are this, these uh, three sculptural figures uh, placed within the box. Again, the box is made of this um, old piece, pieces of wood. And we can see some metal, um, maze of metal uh, inside the box. And the three figures are almost like the, uh, they are embryonic. Uh, they are made of um, clay and they are covered uh, with very thin Japanese paper. I wanted to give the feel uh, of vulnerability um, and fragility. Uh, so, um, and also a, a, a maze within this uh, environment that supposedly is a protective environment. And uh, of course it has the metal uh, grid uh, outside it, uh, almost like a prison. We can move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Um, the last one of these uh, four, uh, I mean, there was uh, a series of many more works, but uh, these are the ones that we are showing here. Um, this box is showing a body that it is uh, cut almost in half, um, the area of uh, the abdomen, uh, which is the creative area uh, of a woman especially, uh, reveals that it has a metal, um, a, a metal structure uh, there, almost imprisoning the creativity of the person. And, uh, and uh, the upper body has a figure again, this, uh, the same figures, like uh, the same way that uh, the figures were made for the previous works. Again, clay and covered with the uh, Japanese paper. Um, so uh, it's, um, uh, it is a work that uh, shows some kind of compromise and division of the, uh, of the human being uh, between the upper and the lower uh, part of the body uh, within this, um, this shell. Um, so uh, I, uh, I found that uh, these works were, although were made uh, quite a long time ago, and because um, I usually uh, do works that come from my unconscious, uh, I find that uh, they suddenly have relevance uh, in other times as well. So um, there we are. Um, I think we have one more of the box worlds as well. All right. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, here we have uh, two figures. And uh, down below we see th these are the images uh, of um, old dolls. Uh, and uh, and uh, again, they are covered with, with a metal uh, structure restricted to exist. Um, and the communication between the two figures above, uh, almost like as if their uh, psyche uh, is connected. So um, there we are. Thank you. There's a lot of vulnerability in these pieces. I feel very human feelings. Um, now we're going to have a look at another kind of preview of uh, your video piece, Necklace in Time, uh, which yes. you have created in collaboration with the artist Nancy Atkin. Um, so I will play the video now and then I'll hand that over to you. Okay. I learned that it is okay to be as we are. I look more like you than my parents. I'm like my parents and not so much like you. That is okay too. 
Enjoy your journey down the clear water of this mighty river. You are in the jasmine flowers. You sparkle on the tips of the gentle waves in the sea. The warmth of the sun on my back, the freshness of the air. It's so much fun going to the park with you. Every time we make a new discovery. I love being in your garden with you. There I can dream about fairies. The diamonds, the rubies and the gold of all the precious moments that I lived. Oh, my little one, they should grace you now. You're the one to carry them forward. Hmm. A very, a very different uh, piece of work. Um, so Nancy Atakan uh, is a friend of mine since uh, many years. Uh, she uh, was born in the States and um, uh, lives in Istanbul since 50 years ago. And I was born in Athens and live in London. So we are both migrants in that sort of sense. Um, we wanted to make a, a project together. And the idea of, about jewelry um, came to us um, a quite a long time. Then we started ago, and then we started researching um, uh, what jewelry means uh, to people, to women, to men. Um, what is the um, uh, what is the significance of a pearl or a diamond or a sapphire? Um, why do we uh, put all this ornamentation on ourselves? And um, and uh, tried to to understand why do women wear this pearl necklace and what does it mean and so on and so forth. So eventually um, both of us uh, realized that we are uh, in this um, stage of life that we are both, uh, we've got children uh, and grandchildren and that uh, jewelry has a different meaning of us. It's something that we would like to bestow uh, to uh, the younger generation um, and as a metaphor uh, to bestowing wisdom and um, feelings and experiences as a legacy and uh, also it, um, it refers to the role of, of the line of women and um, what do they what do they what is their role in life um, they are the, the, the storytellers they are the keepers of tradition they are they and all these things uh, there is a moment that they feel that they would like to uh, leave to the next generation so um, Nancy uh, and Nancy is represented by Pi Artworks and I am a gazelle uh, artist. So we decided to do this project to the, together. And uh, this exhibition um, called, um, it still is as it always was, is still on uh, at Pi Artworks in London. Uh, but because of the coronavirus, it was shut um, just uh, two or three weeks after it opened. So uh, it's still on there and it's still uh, on, uh, <laughs> on show inside parentheses uh, in that gallery. Uh, so um, the, the story of, uh, of making the film uh, is that uh, we were both in Istanbul and uh, looked around to try and find the right location uh, that could express what we wanted to, to say, that it didn't have a specific identity, it wasn't looking like anything Turkish or anything um, um, Greek or <laughs> whatever, you know, it had to have no uh, real identity, not to be recognizable, and uh, really to be, um, uh, to be a place of mystery and a place that we could uh, create this kind of ritual of um, uh, taking off what we carry in life and, and offering it to the next generation. So um, we found this amazing mansion that was uh, absolutely um, gutted by fire and we could use it. Uh, we filmed it, we filmed this, um, uh, we did this film in Istanbul and then it was edited in Athens. 
and uh, um, we designed the clothes that um, we are wearing uh, and made the necklaces uh, and uh, the necklaces you will uh, notice that they have jewels um, at the beginning but then uh, during the ritual uh, we take off the jewels and put on the memories uh, which are small uh, frames of the same size but uh, and shape that carry words uh, as um, um, uh, indicating the memories and the experiences of life, like um, uh, mother, death, um, joy, love, uh, birth, um, and uh, so betrayal, uh, friendship, art, and so on. So uh, eventually, once we have taken off all the jewelry, ready to give it uh, to the next generation. Uh, we take the memories and we move away. Uh, the voices that you hear are from uh, Nancy's and my grandchildren. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, it, 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 it's quite moving. So that's, the, that's what I would like to say about the film. I can take questions if you like. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much, Calliope. Um, uh, thank you so much, everyone, actually, uh, for uh, speaking with us today. So we are now at uh, the end of our um, kind of private view run through of the exhibition, but we will be accepting questions now. So I've seen that uh, in the comment section on Zoom, some of you have written some questions. So if the artists don't mind, we will now proceed into the Q&A section. So I'm going to keep uh, the uh, presentation up and running. If there's any particular work that you want to refer to, let me know as well. And I'm just going to scroll back to the middle. And let's have a look at the questions that people have submitted. Right. So um, we have, I think the first question is for Aziz and Kusher. And uh, the question is, are you still working and uh, exploring new technologies to make your work, i.e. virtual reality, etc.? So are you kind of still exploring new technologies? Uh, Sammy, we, we, we don't seem to hear you. He, he's still mute. Uh, I'm mute myself. Oh, okay, there I am. Um, no, not really. Not so much virtual reality. Um, I mean, we do use in 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 some later works. We have used some uh, like three D modeling, or or um, you know, the, the, in a, in in a piece that we did last year, uh, we use we inserted the performers into uh, virtual environments, into into um, sort of like three D modeled environments, but not in any way the in any interactivity or anything any, anything like that so um, I guess if the the if the work if we if, if we find ourselves thinking of a project that that in which this I, this idea of entering into a virtual world through virtual reality or something like that would be an integral part of the work then we would explore the use of it but so far not so much Thank you. And I think we have another question, which is a general question to all of the participants in the exhibition. And it is, how do you think the current pandemic will influence your understanding of borders uh, from, from the immigration side uh, to the personal barrier side? Well, if I, if I may, um, I think we are experiencing a, a, a deep resurgence of borders, I mean, of, of every kind. Uh, um, this pandemic is forcing people to establish a, a lot more control over, over you know, travel and um, uh, the definition of, you know, even being forced to be at home, to be isolated, is the creation of a new uh, feeling that we are bordered, you know, by our own environment, but then, you know, by, by other political borders that are being established. So I think that, personally, I think that this pandemic is going to be quite, um, uh, it, it's going to have a great influence on our notion of globalization and, uh, and to reestablish the borders and, and, and national borders in a very strong and uh, unfortunate way. 
Um, would anybody else would like to answer the question? My, my answer would almost overlap the one that, that Anton just gave. I, I have the exactly the same feeling. The only thing I can add is that, that the, this pandemic situation is working like a perfect excuse for a lot of uh, uh, political infrastructure to, 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 to make the borders more dense and to bring the borders uh, literally uh, uh, outside the borders. So uh, we, we've seen what the President Trump has just decided a few days ago. So it, it was the perfect, uh, you know, perfect storm that we wouldn't really want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think our next question Oh, sorry, Kaliofi, go ahead. Yes, I would, I would like to point out that um, coronavirus is, is a borderless uh, situation. It, it is uh, remorseless um, and it, uh, it doesn't uh, stop at any border. Uh, it, it's a very frightening um, uh, situation for everyone. Uh, we don't know when it will end. Uh, we don't... Uh, uh, it doesn't respect anything and we have no defense. It is, it is um, you, you know, in my lifetime, <coughs> um, the first time that uh, I feel that there is, there is nothing that you can uh, put against it. And uh, it, it uh, really scares me. Um, at the same time, uh, it makes me feel um, that you know, uh, go back and uh, and see what have I been doing wrong? What have I could what could I have changed in my life? What uh, what is it? What uh, why has it come? You know, it just poses a lot of questions, um, uh, existential questions as well as um, what is important in life. Uh, so, um, you know, within this uh, very scary uh, uh, and confining environment um, uh, one is compelled uh, to go inside uh, psychologically as well absolutely um, Francesco I think the next question is for you so uh, do you know what is the current situation on the Algeria Morocco border uh, it is in reference to the um, Morocco film because it was shot uh, 15 years ago thank you uh, honestly not at all my attention moved somewhere else, so I totally abandoned the, the, the theme and I have no, no clue at all, no idea. Sorry. Thank you. Um, the next question is um, Anthony. It was for Anthony, but I think maybe Sammy, if you can take this one. Um, was this the first time you worked with tapestry? Are you going to revisit this medium later on? Um, well, yes. I mean, the, 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 the first tapestry we made was in 2014. It was the first time we uh, worked with tapestry. We have been wanting to work with tapestries already for a, for, a, for a while since encountering some really amazing exhibits of, of uh, Renaissance tapestries at the Metropolitan Museum here in New York uh, back in 2002 or something like that. There was a series of um, extraordinary uh, uh, tapestries that were brought from, from, from Europe uh, uh, and things that were usually not in view because tapestry is very fragile. So these were things that you know the Metropolitan Museum was able to to bring together uh, Renaissance tapestries and then another exhibition of Baroque tapestries. And uh, we were fascinated by the medium, by the implications of the, uh, the 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 social function of this medium and the expense also of, of how you know how magnificent they were. Uh, so in 2014, we, we were able to produce the first tapestry. Then later on in, in 2017, we produced three more tapestries. Uh, we have designs for other tapestries that have not been produced. So uh, hopefully uh, if we find the, 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 the wherewithal to actually produce them, we will. Uh, and right now we, um, we read about this, um, this tapestry that is in a castle in France that is actually a, a tapestry made during the year of the years of plague in Europe, and it's a, it's a it's a gigantic gigantic tapestry. It's, it's almost a hundred meters long, and it depicts many scenes all related to to plague. And uh, in the last few days, we've just started thinking about 
you know, is this something that we could also revisit in some way? Uh, but we just started looking at some ideas, so it's very early. It's extremely fascinating, thank you. And I think we have actually another question that ties in, because it's uh, about um, the same project. So we have somebody asking, you said the displacement or celebratory figures in your works could be anywhere, but the presence of the US flag in the clothing and the iconography of the tapestries and the desert situation pretty clearly points to the nexus between the US and the Middle East. Uh, I wonder if you can comment on the relationship between uh, that specificity and the more global or universal elements of that work. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that when, you know, we, even though we have a kind of multicultural, multinational, uh, or, you know, uh, uh, relationships in, in our own personal life. I mean, I, I grew up in South America, but my family is Jewish from Israel and Anthony is American, but uh, his family uh, came originally from Lebanon, and we consider ourselves American artists in, in, in a way because we're based here in New York. It's where our career has, uh, where we met, where, where our career has flourished, and where we make our living. So um, it was always important to us to, to, to point that this, this conflict that, that we were interested in, which, which is, you know, the, 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 the kind of endless and cyclical conflicts that ha that happen in the Middle East, uh, where in a way, in 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 in, in many ways and in many instances of the the, the flare-ups of these conflicts were proxy wars, were proxy conflicts between the United States and the Soviet Union at some point, and then later on between, let's say, uh, the forces of um, of you know kind of imperial versus anti-colonial forces in, in some ways. So, um, so the, um, the, it, it, was, it was important for us to, to say, well, we are not coming at this simply as kind of like, you know, political tourists in a way, in the sense that we, are, don't, we don't want to look at this conflict even though it's, it's far away as something that we're just simply, you know, commenting on without any, any, any right or any, or any um, investment or any involvement. And um, be beyond our personal investment because of our national origin or our, our relationship to the, to the region, uh, pointing that the United States is deeply implicated in this, in this conflict uh, was essential to the, to, to, for us in, in, in the project. Um, so, um, but at the same time, we, were, we, were str we, we struggle in, in, you know, we want to make something a work that is that that has a universal character and that that speaks of conflict not in 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 the very in in the very specific area of conflict in the Middle East, but in a more humanistic or more 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 yeah humanistic uh, 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 view of of the kind of the emotional impact of of that conflict and sometimes the the futility of even trying to address it artistically and and that's why uh, you know in this piece that you're seeing right now on the screen, that it's the only piece in which we are in the work, but we are dressed as clowns. Uh, and and this, these clown costumes uh, came out of this idea of wearing our contradictions on our skin and, and, and feeling completely uh, ridiculous, trying to make work that address such a huge topic. Uh, and and uh, so in a way, there's, there's always a, a sense of um, impossibility or, or insufficiency in in our in our uh, in in as as what can we do as artists? You know, when we are dealing with such uh, complex uh, issues, um, I hope that more or less answers the, the question. Yeah, that was very thorough. Thank you. Um, right. I think the next question is for Francesco, and it is how important is for you the familiarity with the geopolitics situation of one region to take a good picture. Um, uh, well, actually, it's, it's, uh, it's the core and the base of everything I do. M most of my work is actually research for knowledge. Uh, even it looks like I travel a lot, I actually don't, don't travel a lot. Even if it might look like I spend most of my time in my, my house, in my studio, reading and studying, uh, mainly because I'm very, very lazy and... Uh, which is quite an important uh, condition of my work. 
and and I'm totally afraid, totally scared of getting into a place and and have a sort of folkloristic view of of of, of the environment. And so um, I, I try to do my best to to leave home with a very, as far as it's possible, deep knowledge of of the history and social condition and read everything has been from from philo philosophical text to everyday newspapers in order to have a sort of uh, I, 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 I need to not to get lost and I, I I'm not the kind of artist who is somehow uh, emotionally involved in something I'm very rational very cold so yeah uh, and of course um, uh, as everything has been happening since when the globaliz globalization started, much earlier than that, I know that everything that happens interesting somewhere usually is not depending from, from things which are really happening there. That's the point. So you also have to go back and forth with readings that probably relate with uh, uh, geopolitical issues with other countries or other continents or not non countries. But, but 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 those institutions and and decisional uh, group of, of of people who are deciding what what should be the future of Armenia or the future of Libya or whatever we are all the people who are actually in in the chat and listening are we are unfortunately too skilled to believe that that anything which has been happening in recent history depends on the local history uh, unfortunately we have we are we are we are we are not allowed it anymore to be mm, we are all in a in a stage of history which is after the end of the innocence and uh, so yes i read a lot and i i read a lot about the place where i want to work and of course reading about that place brings me back usually to the united states to russia or to israel or to china very rarely it brings me back in Europe because I always have the impression with that we are definitely meaningless, both in, in, in good and bad meaning of, 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 of it. So yes, I, I try to be very much aware of the geopolitical situations as, as far as we can be. And uh, there is a beautiful sentence in the monologue of the network film by uh, Sidney Lumet, it's a monologue written by uh, screenwriter Paddy Chayovsky. It's, 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 it was written in 1974, uh, two years before the film was edited, and, 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 and it says, we no longer live in a world of nations and people, uh, and, and, and populations and nations. And I, I, do, I do believe it's true, and I, I think it's true since, since Paddy Chayovsky wrote that. And so I, I always try to keep that in mind. So every time I'm investigating either Dubai or Uzbekistan or, or, or Brazil, I always try to keep in mind where the, the, the new subverting movements are actually uh, originated. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I think the next question is for Calliope. And it is, what role does mythology play in your work? It seems archetypal for an external viewer. Can you say so about your work? Yeah. Uh, yes, of course, the archetypes are, are very central uh, to my work uh, because what I am aspiring to do is to, um, whatever I do, to have resonance to people uh, through times and uh, through depth, so I'm not, uh, I'm not aiming uh, for people to um, approach my work in an intellectual way. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm much more aiming to get them to react to my work uh, from their guts, from their psyche. Uh, so um, I'm fortunate to have grown uh, up in Greece and. Uh, really learned the, the Greek mythology um, from scratch. And uh, later on, I expanded my knowledge to mythologies of um, the Middle East and, uh, you know, Iraq, Babylonia, Syria, also the, the Egyptian mythology, they're all connected 
and uh, also um, go to you to Europe, uh, the rest of European countries. So my research um, is the connection uh, that we all have in a deeper level uh, beyond um, the manifestations of what is happening right now in the world, but where is the seed of, um, of um, our actions now? And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, funnily enough or strangely enough or really, uh, uh, it, they do, you know, the, the study of mythology really explains a lot of, uh, of what we're um, living through at all times. So that's, that's um, yeah, it is very important for me. Amazing, thank you. I think we have a question for all of the artists as well. And it is, do you think the definition of immigrants and expats needs to be revisited? Quite a challenging question. Hmm. Would anyone like to take that? <laughs> Well, um, it is a difficult, it is a difficult question. Uh, yeah, I, I come from um, a migrant family. My, my grandparents came from Izmir, uh, being Greek, um, and now Izmir is in Turkey. Uh, I came from uh, Greece and I'm living here. So what am I calling myself? A migrant, an expat? So what, what, what am I, first of all? And uh, then um, what, uh, I mean, what, what is the significance of, of, the, of the, the naming really? Uh, basically, again, I feel uh, that uh, whether one is a migrant or um, not a migrant uh, or a local, um, a, a, in a deeper level, we are all human. We all need um, the same, um, you know, we have the same needs. We have human rights. Uh, so uh, I think these are, these are questions to be uh, really addressed. And, uh, and how do we tackle this uh, tremendous problem um, that uh, since I have started working with uh, the mass migration problem uh, and made installations uh, all over the place, collecting the boats uh, of people who uh, transferred themselves from the coast of Turkey to Europe and so on and so forth, uh, I, I don't think that we have really um, tackled that question and, uh, and uh, tried to resolve it properly. So it's, it's uh, become... Um, huge <laughs> even uh, by day it becomes huge and i don't know what is going to happen after this crisis that we're facing right now which comes on top of migration and so on so i think it is um uh, we we really need need to address uh, this problem from a different scope altogether uh, because we are uh, um, responsible for um what is happening to half the world. So we need to really face that truth. Absolutely. Um, I think our next question is for Francesco. And it is, how important is for you the, uh, oh, sorry, the, do you think the current situation with the quarantine and disease will have the same influence on globalization and borders as 9-11 did and the 2008 crisis? Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, of course, because this is probably the biggest worldwide event since World War II, and we are almost definitely sure it is. And so in a way, it's even more uh, significant than 9-11, and of course, and, and 2008 cry, uh, economical crisis were, were. The point is, that, and at the same time, it's totally different because uh, whether you agree with me or not, both 9-11 and, and, and 2008 were both very uh, well planned and organized and controlled kind of uh, events. Why, whether you agree or not with me, I, I still think that this pandemic situation was just something that happened. 
and we could expect, but it was not really controlled or desired or organized or whatever. So they're very different. What, what I what I think it's but what I think is it's exactly the same is not really it's the control of the consequences. This is what I think. I would I personally think that uh, every time something like every time there is a fracture in contemporary history, uh, which means to me uh, uh, after Second World War, and, and that's the case for an example of the foundation, uh, the creation of CIA. Every, every time there is a fracture, there always must be organizations able to profit. And, and I, don't, I don't mean economically, I mean uh, just to adjust the, the, the way people will think the day after. So uh, to, to give you just a very simple example, we are all scared by uh, this pandemic. We are all self secluded, we live in our houses. And we are scared of dying, scared for the people we love, or scared of whatever. But actually, the very interesting thing that there is, there are groups of people who are just uh, simply planning what the, the next scenario. And I'm very interesting. For example, in Italy, yesterday, two very important directors of two major newspapers were changed. Uh, uh, and it's, of course, something that has redundancies and consequences on the, on the political uh, aspects of the country. And it, it, ju it just, the news just went, you know, underneath because everybody's speaking about today there, there have been 1,000 die the death, uh, tomorrow there will be 2,000, that's it. So uh, I'm, uh, it, my answer is that yes, and, uh, 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 and it, it's exactly the same. Uh, the consequences are the same. When 9-11 happened, uh, and when 2008 subprime or whatever happened, and what is happening these days, it's important because there are people who are already reshaping the consequences and you know modulating everything in order to profit on 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 way on the way that most of the communities, most of the people will be thinking and deciding and voting in the next years. So yes, yes, it's a yes in this kind, from this perspective. Amazing, thank you. Uh, I think our next question is for Calliope, and you talked about existential borders. What do you mean by that? Well, existential borders um, can be the, the our body is existential border. Uh, our, our our home is an existential border, and. Uh, Furthermore, you know, existential is um, uh, defines uh, the existence of the human being, uh, ourselves. So existential borders are what defines us, how we are, what, are, what do we feel, what we um, uh, feel uh, from the point of view of uh, the body, as well as, uh, as what we think, how how we um, define the world around uh, around us and what where, where is our uh, position within this world? That's an existential uh, uh, border for us. That defines our existence within the world. Thank you for elaborating, Gliopi. Um Now we have a, a question for Francesco. Um, did you have urgency to come back to Uzda uh, uh, town and see the status of the houses you shot, or it, uh, or sorry, or they have been enhanced or further developed? Um, no, as I said before, I didn't have any. Actually, honestly, any. I was not curious to come back. I, I rarely come back in the places where I already worked. No, I didn't. I didn't care about that anymore. Might be something interesting to revisit as well. Um, I'd be quite interested to have a look. And I think we have another question for Calliope. And you were speaking about the role of women in society and life. Did you witness any changes in these roles recently? Sorry, did they? Uh, did you witness any changes in the roles of women in society and in life recently? Uh, recently? Uh, well, uh, women are um, fighting um, for equality um, with the men and uh, how they are uh, being um, uh, dealt with, uh, how their uh, society uh, treats them uh, for uh, 
for I mean since uh, since a long time ago, and uh, I, I do see that uh, gradually, gradually they are uh, uh, trying to uh, bring this uh, this equality. Uh, are you talking about what I meant uh, about the film or um, a different question altogether? I don't know what's. Uh, I, I think it was more of a general question about how do you think the roles of uh, women in society maybe have changed over the years or stayed the same and how that reflects in your work? Well, not, not in every part of the world um, um, happens the same thing. Uh, you know, there are, there are other countries that women have uh, a lot more freedom and uh, equ um, enjoy equality, and there are other parts of the world that they still und uh, are under um, under pressure and under um, you know not being regarded as equal uh, human beings. And uh, so, uh, it, although I, I can say that uh, things have been changing um, gradually. Uh, I do uh, still know that uh, uh, women in, in different parts, parts of the world uh, are still oppressed and uh, treated differently. That is very true. Um, I think our next question may be um, uh, Sammy and Francesco, you would be able to answer. We have a listener who's asking, which is the book that inspired uh, most your trip to Israel? Well, I, I have to say my, our trips to Israel, I mean, I go to Israel all the time because my family is, is there, but my, the inspiration is personal. It's not because of a book. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's my own education and my own um, uh, relationship to that place. Um, but there are, of course, many books that, that you know, uh, political or, or you know, novels. Uh, there's an in, infinite amount of literature about the place. Uh, but in my personal case, it's, it's more personal. Francesca? Uh, in my case, well, actually, um, um, when I did the photographs you showed, I, I was actually not meant to be working there. I was invited by a museum. But actually, I have a book that really influenced me before, before, uh, before, for traveling, and it's actually uh, the Lonely Planet Guide. When I when I when I was uh, going to when I knew that I was going, I went uh, uh, to buy in a in a bookshop uh, a Lonely Planet Guide, and I um, I found out that it's actually it was titled in Italiano in Italian, Israele e i territori palestinesi, and I thought it was an Italian mistake or something, so I went checking for the the American version of the English version of the, of, of the, of the guide, it was the same. It's Israel and Palestinian territories. So I went for other editions that I went for the German, the Russian, the Spanish, and it was always the same. So worldwide, it's always like you go to Israel and then there is this place which is like a garden or a lake or territories. It's, it's not a place. There are no people, no nation, no rights. And I was very sure. So I really went through, uh, I'm a very good user of, of, of tourist guides. It's, uh, um, even when I go in places that I know, I, I like to read them because it's, you know, it's, it's like a sort of nerdish or um, now it disappeared. simple per per perspective that people have on, on countries. But that book was really weird because, you know, it was a, it was a lesson of bureaucracy. You were still speaking about Palestina, which for some reason they don't have their own touristic guide. It, it all depends from Israel, and everything was in the perspective of, of, the, of the fact that you were going to Israel, and eventually you could go to this place, which, by the way, since the title you have to remember, it's not a nation. And it was very interesting, very interesting. So, for example, the page where usually when you buy a tourist guide, they tell you, if you want to go there, you need a passport, you need this visa, or you don't need it so if you're traveling through Europe, which is, by the way, about borders. No, it's not going to be true if I want to travel to UK very soon. Uh, but how, how is that page made in a tourist guide, which is about a nation 
and another nation which by the first nation is not recognized as a nation in the United Nations. So it's a very interesting kind, it's, a, it's the most special kind of tourist uh, guide you could buy ever. So yeah, it, I would never say that if you were asking me what is a good book to read if you're traveling to Japan, I would suggest uh, whatever. Uh, but in that kind, the tourist, the tourist guide book is a, it's a, it's quite an interesting book to, 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 to go through and, and, and see the grammar, see the semiotic. It's quite interesting. Draws very interesting parallels. Yeah, it's uh, definitely something that I want to explore as well. Um, I think if there isn't any more questions, so uh, if anybody in the audience would like to ask any more questions to our artists, please feel free to do so now. If no, we're going to kind of wind down a little bit and talk about our upcoming program in conjunction with the show. I'm just going to give you a few minutes to type any questions that you might have. In the meantime, while we're uh, taking this time, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Sammy, Anthony, Francesco, and Calliope for joining us today. Uh, thank you for your, uh, for your amazing uh, experience and for sharing your practice and your outlook on such a challenging subject as borders. Um, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for answering the questions. And we hope that uh, more of our visitors will get to experience your work both digitally throughout um, this kind of period of quarantine and also physically because we are uh, as i mentioned previously planning to host a physical exhibition of borders later on in the year once we reopen and we are able to welcome everybody back uh, right i think we have no more questions so uh, on behalf of the gallery thank you for joining us today and uh, next week uh, in our program, we have upcoming an upcoming screening. It's going to be on Friday, the 1st of May. And it is a uh, screening of uh, the experience of the installation in some country under the sun and some clouds, as well as the uh, film report from the front by Aziz and Kusher. Uh, further details will be announced both in our newsletter and our social media. So if you're not following us yet, if you're not subscribed yet, do so because that's where all of the details will be released. So definitely stay tuned and it will be um, quite a similar format. So we're going to both have a uh, Zoom Q&A post um, the viewing and the viewing is going to be done uh, simultaneously on our Vimeo channel. So we're extremely excited about that. Our upcoming program also includes the screenings of um, video works by um, Francesco Giudice and Calliope Lemos. Once again, the details of those will be announced at a later date. Um, and we look forward extremely to connecting with you in person as well. Uh, once things get back to normal, we're looking forward to seeing our artists in London too, uh, next time uh, when they're here. And yeah, thank you very much for joining us today. If you need any further information on any of the works, if you like a brochure, um, we can send you one. Just email us either on info at gazelleyarthouse.com or sales at gazelleyarthouse.com. And we look forward to connecting with you more in the coming future. Once again, thank you everyone for being with us this evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone at the gallery for organizing. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Calliope and Francesco. And uh, thank you, everyone. I have to thank run. You. Nice now. to meet you, too. So, lovely. Lovely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Take care. Stay at home and stay safe. Thank you.